The first part of my talk is going to be about what we're looking for and why, where we means all the people who actually do the real work at CERN while I drink coffee and think about the universe. So, starts with the question, what is a fundamental particle? And our view on that has changed with time. And for those of you who have really good eyes, you'll notice that I kept the French wording he here wherever I could. Uh, so, oh, a, couple of, a couple of thousand years ago, we figured that out, or at least some people did, that matter might not be continuous, that there might be little, it might actually consist of little bits uh, called atoms. Um, it took us a long time to figure out that there were really atoms and that those atoms were mostly empty space with electrons on the outside, negatively charged particles, and on the center, these much more massive, very small objects, the nuclei of the atoms. Um, but it didn't take us much longer to figure out that those nuclei themselves were not fundamental particles. What does that mean? It means that they're made up of other things. And the things they're made up of are neutral particles called neutrons and positively charged particles called protons. And then by the 1960s, we had figured out that even those protons and neutrons weren't fundamental particles. They were made up of things called quarks. Each neutron and each proton was made up of three quarks as well as a lot of other stuff running around inside. Well, so in the something called the standard model, which is our model of how fundamental particles, what fundamental particles there are, and how they interact with each other, and it's an incredibly good model. It explains essentially all of the interactions of, of the particles in nature, with the exception of gravity. And, um, with small updates, explains everything that we've ever been able to test about fundamental particles. And it does so to incredible precision. We've never yet found a way in which the standard model truly fails. Okay. So uh, what are the particles of the standard model? There are these things called leptons, which means light particles, like the electron. And then there are these things inside the proton and neutron called the up quark and the down quark. So a proton is two ups and a down, and a neutron is an up and two downs. And that's all we really need to explain everything around here, like this stuff and this stuff and everything, everything we manage to, uh, to use in our everyday life. But nature wasn't, wasn't uh, happy with just that. Turned out there, were, the electron had a there was a copy of the electron called the muon, which is much, much heavier than the electron, but otherwise identical. Okay. And that's not it. It turns out the electron has a partner called the neutrino, the electron neutrino. Uh, and the electron neutrino is, first of all, very, very light. Okay. Uh, so light, in fact, that we haven't yet actually detected its mass, although we infer that it has a mass. And it's able to penetrate through huge amounts of material. In fact, we see neutrinos, when I say see, we detect neutrinos coming all the way from the very center of the sun. They're made at the center of the sun. They travel through the sun without hitting any of the material in the sun and get into our detectors. And most of them just fly straight through our detectors. But if we make our detectors big enough and wait long enough, we can see neutrinos coming from the very center of the sun. Well, the zoo keeps growing. The muon, of course, has to have its partner or would get jealous. There's other, two other quarks, the charm and the strange, which are just like the up and the down, except heavier or more massive. Uh, well, actually, there's another one called the bottom quark. So it's not just the down and the strange. And um, there's another particle like the electron and the muon, even heavier. And it has its particle, the tau neutrino. And then we were able to predict the existence of the one that's clearly missing, the top quark. And that was filled in. In, uh, in, the, in the 1990s. So those are all of what we call the particles of matter that exist in the standard model. And the only ones we see around us on an everyday basis are the electron, the up and the down quark. But we actually need there to be this many quarks and uh, this many particles in order to explain certain properties of the universe. OK. There are also the antiparticles of those. Uh, and we're going to we will at some point talk about antiparticles. We've talked about them in the past. They're particles with the same properties as these, but opposite charges. Okay. So that's our zoo. That's the thing we get to work with. Those are the particles that interact in the universe and that we build things out of. Okay. Now, in order for them to interact, 
that means that there are forces between them, and those forces are themselves carried by particles. So we have a force of electromagnetism that holds atoms together, and it's carried by the particles of light. So the particles coming out of that light over there are called photons, and they are actually responsible for transmitting the electromagnetic force between a ch two charged objects. Okay, so for example, the proton and the electron are held together in the atom, is kind of, by photons running between them. Or at least that's how we talk about it. There are other ones called gluons. They carry, there are eight of them, they carry what's called the color force, responsible for holding the, pro, the quarks together inside a proton or inside a neutron. And then there are these things called the W and Z particles that are responsible for weak interactions. We don't see weak interactions on a daily basis holding things together, but they're the interactions that are responsible for uh, the sun working, so for the sun being able to burn. So, we had our matter particles, our electron, our muon, our tau, these things called leptons, and our quarks that went into building protons and neutrons and their heavier, shorter-lived relatives. And then we have these force carriers, the photon, the gluons, and W and Z. And we're not going to talk about gravity, and if there is a particle that carries gravity, people call it the graviton. We haven't found it yet because gravity is so weak. We don't know how to include gravity in the standard model. But the standard model is actually missing something, and what's missing is mass. So the standard model, as I've told you about it so far, um, has no way to give mass to, par to important particles, or at least without an extra component that I haven't yet told you about, uh, the model, any attempt of the model to give mass to those particles would not quite be right. So you might ask, why do we need mass? Well, massless particles always travel at the speed of light. So you, want, you saw them there crossing the screen very quickly. If particles had no mass, they would always move at the speed of light. And you might have noticed that you generally travel uh, slower than the speed of light. Okay. In fact, even our fastest runners don't travel at the speed of light. Most things don't travel anywhere close to the speed of light unless we work really, really hard at making them travel near the speed of light. And so, Fundamental matter particles, like the electron, the muon, the quarks, they need to have mass. Why else do we need mass? Well, it turns out that those force carriers, if they're massless, will result in very long-range forces, forces that extend over very large distances, unless the force uh, does something called getting strong or confine. So electromagnetism, we talked about three forces. The first one was electromagnetism. It actually has a very long or, or really an infinite range. Uh, for example, you might have noticed uh, lightning in which electrons are, are sucked from either the sky to the ground or the ground to the sky, depending on the bolt. Um, and that's because of very long range forces that are able to pull the electrons those very long distances from the sky to the ground and the ground to the sky. Okay. So that's good. Maybe a massless force carrier would be okay for electromagnetism. The strong interactions, this color interaction carried by the gluons, it actually does get strong. But this, and that's what keeps quarks inside of protons and neutrons. But our last interaction, the weak interactions, they're at weak and they're very short range. What does that mean? It means that the distance over which weak interactions work are much smaller than the diameter of, an, of, of a proton. Okay. So if weak interactions were carried by massless particles like photons, they wouldn't behave like that. So we don't understand weak interactions unless the w plus and minus and z, the things that carry it, have a mass. So what have we learned? We learned there are particles that things are made of, quarks and electrons. They need a mass. There are particles that carry force, and some of them need a mass. Many of them don't. Photons don't need a mass. But we have different types of particles, and they all need a mass. And so far, we have nothing in the model that I've told you to give them mass. And people struggled with this question of how to give fundamental particles mass. As I said, photons and gluons, they don't need a mass. The charged leptons and quarks, you could actually put it in by hand if you wanted to, but the W and the particles in the Z, these particles that were discovered in the 1970s, predicted and discovered, there's no way to add mass 
by hand without breaking the model, without making the model not make sense. Giving you, when you do a calculation with the model, it would give you the wrong answer no matter how hard you tried. And so people were happy when in the 1960s, people in, someone invented something called the Higgs mechanism and its resulting boson that I'll tell you about. So this is a fellow named Peter Higgs. Um, and you might guess that he invented the Higgs mechanism and the Higgs boson. Actually, it was kind of a collective effort. Here's some other people who were involved. Uh, Tom Kibble, Gerald Gralnick. Oops, Richard, Richard, Richard Hagen, Francis Engelbert, Robert Brout. So there are all sorts of you know, disagreements on who really deserves the credit for inventing the Higgs mechanism and the particle that we're going to discover called the Higgs boson. Um, other people would say, well, it was really a few fellows named Weinberg and Salam who were, who were responsible for it. But anyway, there is, they invented this way of giving particles mass. So let me tell you a little bit about that. And to do that, we have to talk about something called a field. So what's a field? Well, a field is something that fills space in some way, something that has a value everywhere in space. So for example, the electric field uh, here is filling the space between the sky and the ground and pulling the electrons either down or up, depending on where, how this bolt is working. You've probably, at some point, seen iron filings sprinkled on, around a magnet and how they line up along these strange lines called magnetic field lines. Okay, so that's, that's, those, are, um, those are signs of the magnetic fields. We have electric fields, we have magnetic fields, and that magnetic field can bend the paths of charged particles. So when particles move through ma the magnetic field, their paths get bent. Okay. Well, the Higgs field is another field, okay. and if the Higgs field is zero, that means that particles like electrons and quarks don't have mass. So as I said, they travel at the speed of light through the, through the universe. But if we turn the Higgs field on, then something happens. All of a sudden, things get mass. So on one side, we're over here where there's no Higgs field, fundamental particles have no mass. But over here, they do have mass. and so the cat is heavy. The fundamental particles have weight because they have mass. And so if we are in a place where the Higgs field isn't zero, then fundamental particles get mass. So if we shot a particle into across, across the here from the place where it was traveling at the speed of light, when it came into the region where it had, the Higgs field wasn't zero, it would slow down. So the Higgs field is this thing that seems to fill space and give mass to fundamental particles. Okay. Now, where there's a field, there can also be a ripple in the field. Okay. So just like if we have a pond and we disturb the pond, we get waves. What that light source is doing is disturbing the electric and mag magnetic field and giving us photons to allow us to see. In the same way, we can have disturbances in the Higgs field. And that's what we call a Higgs particle. So if this is the Higgs field, it gets disturbed, and that looks to us like a particle. And that particle we're going to call the Higgs particle, or the Higgs boson, which is a description of the type of particle it is. So the standard model actually has another particle that we haven't, at least as of a year ago, hadn't seen. It had all these leptons, these light particles, partners and copies of the electron. It had the quarks, things like the particles that make up neutrons and protons. It had particles that carried force. And we had seen all of these by the early 1990s, by 20 years ago. But we had yet to see this particle that the standard model told us was responsible for giving mass to fundamental particles. And that was a great mystery. Now, so that's something we want to find out. We want to look for that, if we can, at a, at a, by building some sort of experiment. There are other things worth looking for, and I'll tell you about them. Dark matter particles, supersymmetric particles, black holes in X dimensions. You've heard about some of those things in the past. We'd also like to just look for things that we don't know about. And I'll start to tell you about how we can do that and what we found at, in the next part of the talk. When doesn't the Higgs uh, field uh, fill space, and under what conditions? OK, so the Higgs field um, has, as far as we know, 
everywhere here the Higgs field has, is, is in zero. Okay? So the Higgs field has a value everywhere that we live. Uh, it might have early in the universe been zero. Okay? In fact, our theory suggests that early in the universe the Higgs field was zero and so particles were massless. And then as time went on and the universe cooled, the Higgs field settled into a value that wasn't zero and, and particles got a mass. When I say early in the history of the universe, I mean in the first billionth of a second or maybe trillionth of a second, uh, particles didn't have mass. And then the universe cooled uh, and, and particles got a mass because the Higgs field had a value. Okay, so as far as we know though, at this point, everywhere that we look in the universe, the Higgs field has exactly the same value or so close to the same value that we, that, uh, we can't notice any difference. Particles have the same mass everywhere. In your discussion of mass, you haven't mentioned gravity. And don't we have to have mav mass to have gravity? The answer is no. We don't have to have mass to have gravity. And we ha don't have to have gravity to have mass. Um, we have to have, uh, to have mass. We use the word mass in two ways. And, and the fact that they're equivalent is is an, a happy accident or a profound accident. We, mass means two things. One, it means how difficult is it for me to move something. So if it's sitting here and I push on it, how, hard, how easily does it respond? Clearly, it's easier for me to move this laser pointer than it is to move this desk because the desk has more mass. Okay. That's true here. It's true out, in, out somewhere very far from Earth where there's much less gravity. Okay, so that has to do with the mass of something. We also say the mass, and what we mean is how, how strongly does gravity pull on something. So clearly this has less gravitational mass because it's easier to pick it up than it is to pick up this desk. Right? So if I try to pick up the desk, the desk has more gravitational mass. So there's, there, there are these two words that we use, and they happen to be related, um, and that's profound. That's called the equivalence principle. It's at the root of Einstein's theory of general relativity. So, so they're co they are connected. In this case, what I'm really talking about, though, is this ability, you know, is how hard it is to move something. So if I push on it, how does it respond? Okay. And that turns out to be connected to gravity, but, but indirectly. I'm really talking about how hard is it to give momentum to something if I push on it. OK, so we want to look for this particle called the Higgs. And the question is, how do we look for the Higgs or really most anything that we haven't made yet? How do people go about discovering new fundamental particles like the Higgs? And at the root of it is this equation, E equals mc squared, which is very famous. And I'm sure you recognize it. And it says that if something has mass, then it has energy. That's what it says. So if I have a particle that has mass, like the Higgs particle turns out to have mass, I have to have a certain amount of energy to make it. Now, it turns out the Higgs particle has, even, you know, be, even before we discovered it, was known to have a lot of mass, at least 100 times the mass of the proton. So therefore, to make it, you had to assemble the energy of at least 100 protons in a very small space, the, about the size of whatever the Higgs particle is going to be. Okay. So somehow, we had to get a lot of energy into a very small space. And we can sit around thinking of ways to do that, but the ways that particle physicists have done it for the last basically 100 years is by smashing particles together. So you smash particles together, and stuff comes out, and you look at the stuff. And you try to reconstruct went on and what went on at that collision. Okay. And we need to do it over and over and over again, because most of the time, we smash things together, and nothing very interesting comes out. So we do it again, and we smash stuff together, and nothing very interesting comes out. Um, but if we're lucky, occasionally something interesting will happen. So we'll smash two things together, and maybe a Higgs will come out. <laughs> OK, so we, we need to not just make this, ha make this interesting thing like the Higgs by smashing particles together. We actually need to notice that we've made it. And that's harder than you think, because we're making lots and lots of stuff, and, and it's very small. And it all decays into just a few types of things. And so we have to build a very large machine called a, 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 the Large Hadron Collider. We have to build a very large accelerator to accelerate the particles to smash into each other. And then we have to build at least two 
very large detectors. Why two? Well, because suppose we see something interesting in one. We might not believe it. So we have to have another one to double check it. So I'm going to talk about the Large Hadron Collider, which is a, this very large machine, uh, incredible machine in, in CERN, just outside Geneva, and the two detectors that have been used to discover the Higgs particle called the Atlas Detector and CMS. And it all starts with getting protons. Uh, the LHC does, uses protons. Other machines have used protons and antiprotons, or electrons and antielectrons, or electrons and protons. You, you, you make choices depending on what you're going to do. They're using protons. And the nice thing about protons is you can just buy them at the store. Right? We have lots of them here. In this case, they use bottles of hydrogen gas. And what you do when you want protons is you open the bottles and out come hydrogen. That's nice, that's easy. So you have hydrogen, which consists of a proton, which you want, an electron, which you don't. So you stick an electric field on, the electron goes running away, and the proton moves slowly. Because right? the proton is about 2,000 times more massive than the electron. So the electric field doesn't pull it away as fast. So now you have these protons, and they, are, they have a mass equal to what we call 1 GeV. The G stands for a billion. The EV means electron volts, and it's connected to those volts on your battery. It's a unit of energy. It has a E equals mc squared of 1 billion electron volts. Uh, pretty close. And what we now need to, what we need to do is we need to give it a lot more energy. Okay, so we need to give it more than mc squared. We give it, need to give it about 8,000 times mc squared. Okay? So to do that, we actually we, we can't use one machine. We have to use a whole series of machines, starting with something called a linear accelerator. And that only gives it a very little bit of energy, 50 million electron volts. Okay? So million electron volts is a lot of energy, but compared to what we need, it's only a tiny bit. It's only a little, it's it really isn't making the proton go very fast, much less than the speed of light. And we st then stick it into something called the proton synchrotron booster, which gets it up to uh, 1,400, so uh, 1.4 billion electron volts, and then the proton synchrotron, which gets it up to 25 billion electron volts. At this point, the proton is moving very close to the speed of light. It has 25 times more energy due to its motion than the equals mc squared. And then we stick it into this thing called the super proton synchrotron, which gets it up to 450 times its mass energy. And finally, we put it into the, into the new machine, which has only been running a couple of years and is now shut down for two years for upgrade, called the Large Hadron Collider. And that takes it all the way up to having 8 trillion electron volts of energy, or 8,000 times mc squared. And at that point is we're moving at 99.999999% of the speed of light. What does that look like? Well, it's actually a sequence of old accelerators. Here's the li linear accelerator. Here's a picture of the this proton synchrotron booster, the proton synchrotron, the super proton synchrotron, and finally the new machine, the Large Hadron Collider. But they all work in fundamentally the same way what they do is they use microwave surfing machines. Okay. So they have the protons, that they get the protons to surf on waves of electric field generated using microwave cavities. So think of these as your microwave oven linked together, very carefully built microwave ovens linked together, and they stick on it instead of your, you know, your uh, slowly oscillating, what is it, 60 hertz come, that's, that comes out of your plug, they have a, a voltage that oscillates 400 million times a second, 400 million hertz. So by doing that, they get an electric field inside this cavity that's going this way over here and then this way over here, this way, this way, this way, this way. So it's, it's changing direction in each of those you know, very quickly. And you stick the proton in in such a way that it gets caught up in one of the rays that's traveling down along this way. And it's just like a surfer. The surfer is sitting there on, on the surface, and a wave comes along. And the surfer goes along and gets, gets him or herself going with the wave. And then the wave pushes the surfer and gives the surfer more energy, more velocity, so that they are moving quicker, more quickly. So each time a proton passes through one of these 
cavities, one of these radio frequency accelerators, it gives us an extra 16 million electron volts. But we want to give it 8 trillion electron volts. And so it turns out it actually has to go through one of these things more than a million times. Now, if we put a million of these end to end, that wouldn't work very well. Okay? That would be way too long. So what they do is they stick them in circular accelerators so that they can go in over and over and get kicked over and over. So we start with that linear accelerator, the proton booster, the proton synchrotron, the super proton synchrotron, which then sends the, L the protons into two different rings, one going this way and one going this way called the Large Hadron Collider. And now the, the protons can go round and round, and every time they go round, they're getting multiple kicks. To give you a sense of size, here is uh, the city of Geneva, a lake called, the largest lake in, in uh, Western Europe called Lake Geneva, or Lac Le Mont, and the Jura Mountains, and the LHC, or Large Hadron Collider, is a 17 miles, 27 kilometers in circumference, 100 meters underground beneath uh, Geneva and the surrounding French and Swiss countryside. And every time the, the protons go around the ring, they, they cross the border multiple times. Here's an aerial view. And I live right about here. So they're going round and round and round. They start off over here, go around this one, go around this one, and get injected into this large hadron collider. Now they're going around and around and around in circles. And to do that, to get them going around in circles, we need thousands of superconducting magnets, both to get the, to go keep them going around and to stop them from spitting out of this beam. Um, and those superconducting magnets have to be cooled to about 1.9 degrees above absolute zero. To get them down there, it takes about 10,000 tons of liquid nitrogen, and then a cooling system that has about 100 tons of liquid helium in it, okay? and a vacuum that's much better than in the space station. And the whole thing uses about 120 megawatts, or about the same as a city of about 100,000 100, people in the United States. You get about 100, you, you assemble 115 billion of the protons into a little bunch. You put 1,400 of them going one way, 1,400 of them going the other way, and you circulate them around this ring, and you cross the rings uh, at several points. At the moment, at four points. And we're interested in two of them, one here and one opposite over here. And at one of them, called intersection point one, they have all sorts of clever names at CERN, like restaurant one. Uh, this is intersection point one, where the Atlas experiment is. And across from it is intersection point five, where the CMS experiment is. So to give you a sense, here is, it's hard to tell how big this is. You'll see in the next picture. This is the Atlas experiment. Um, I'll tell you about size in a moment. Here is the CMS experiment. And if you look carefully, you'll see a person there. So these things are absolutely massive. The CMS experiment has a, weighs 15,000 tons and is as big as a five-story building. The Atlas experiment is, is, isn't quite as massive, isn't quite as heavy, but it covers 12,000 square feet and is over eight stories high, and all of this is 100 meters underground. Okay. So you have these proton bunches intersecting four million times per second in each detector. Imagine four million times, and every time they intersect, tens, or, tens to hundreds of pairs of protons collide and spew out all sorts of stuff that you have to measure. And those particles come out. They're all sorts of particles of the standard model. They decay, however, into just a few, electrons and muons and protons and neutrons and antineutrons, these things called pions that, that have to do with the strong nuclear force photons, neutrinos, and the detectors, these detectors have to detect and measure and reconstruct and look for what was made in the first place. And they have to do all of that at this incredible rate because you have 4 million intersections every second. Okay? And so what they have to do is they have to throw almost all of the data away. So you build this machine to cause all these collisions and you know that most of those collisions are completely uninteresting. 
so you throw them away. But you have to decide which ones to throw away really, really quickly because there's another set of collisions that are happening 25 billionths of a second later, okay? which is just enough time for the information to get from the center of the detector basically out to the edge. So between the time where the information, the, the signal has gotten from where the collision happened to the, to the edge of the detector, you have to decide, do I keep it or do I toss it? Keep it or toss it? You have to do that over and over and over again. So even still, they keep about 100 interesting events every second. So here's a picture, and we'll go into more detail in a while, of, this, of the one called the compact muon solenoid, or CMS experiment. And this is what happens when those bunches collide. You get a mess. And out of this mess, you have to decide, is this mess interesting? Do I keep it, or do I toss it? And to do that, they have all sorts of detectors. We're going to talk about silicon detectors and calorimeters, which are giant thermometers, and muon detectors. Okay. And they have to then send this information to the computer center in, uh, at the center of CERN, not the physical center, the, the uh, administrative center. And it's producing 15 million gigabytes of data even after throwing away almost all of it. You can't process that all in one place. So what you have to do is you have to send it out all over the world to have the information processed. That's why the cloud was invented. It was actually invented in order to be able to process CERN's data. Okay, so if you store information on the cloud, it's thanks to CERN. Okay. So it has to be sent out and they have to send it out to 179 institutions in 41 countries where over 3,000 physicists and lots and lots of technicians and students are waiting to analyze it in order to be able to look at it. So the question is, after all of that, after taking 20 years to build this machine and let's call it $10 billion and counting, and 10,000 people's years of effort over those 20 years, what have we learned with this machine? And that's what I'll tell you about in the third part of the talk. Why was this concern about a black hole uh, occurring? OK, so well, actually, I, I'm going to answer that right at the beginning of the talk. And if I haven't answered that fully, we can ask, I'm happy to talk more about it. That's actually, the, of all the pieces that, I, that, that I'm talking about, I have contributed nothing to any of these. Okay? And the one, I mean, you can imagine, there's, 10, 000, there's thousands of people working on this, and everyone has a little piece. The piece that I've contributed is telling people what a black hole would look like if we made one. Okay. I, when I say I, I mean I and my students and collaborators who wrote some software to tell people what black holes would actually look like. And I'll tell you, if I don't tell you why now, I can tell you later why black holes aren't a concern. We talked about, or you talked about, the, uh, the leptons and the, the quarks having no mass. And they would get a little mass from uh, the Higgs field. And I'm having trouble getting from no mass to this coffee stirrer or this microphone. Can you go into that a little deeper? Realize that there are billions and billions and bil billions of, uh, billions of billions of billions of protons in here. Okay, so that's why it has so much mass. So each proton has a very tiny amount of mass. Of the mass that each proton has, only about um, a couple of percent comes directly from the Higgs. For an electron, all its mass comes from its interaction with the Higgs. For a proton, only the mass of the actual individual quarks running around in the proton come from the Higgs. Now you might say, well, where does it get the rest of its mass? And it gets the rest of its mass basically from the strength of the interaction between those quarks. So there's a lot of energy that it takes to bind those quarks. The quarks would like to go flying out of the proton. And these particles called gluons that carry this force we call color keep them in there, bind them into this very, very tight space. And that takes a lot of energy to bind them. And that energy, that is essentially the mass of the proton. So the mass of the proton is mostly the has to do with the binding of the quarks into the proton. And same with the neutron. Okay? The very small differences, for example, the neutron has a little bit more mass than the proton. And that has to do 
with the difference in mass between the up quarks and the down quarks that are living inside the neutron and the proton. So the, the proton has more of the up quarks, which are more mass, uh, sorry, of the, uh, uh, well, it's, it's a combination of the masses of the quarks and also their charges. So, um, so the, the relative masses of different, uh, of different quarks are very small compared to the masses of the things they're bound into. It's a very peculiar situation. It's not true of the heavier quarks. So we had that whole list of quarks. So for example, if, we, if, the, if, the universe, if the things in matter were made of top quarks and bottom quarks, if our protons were made of top and bottom instead of up and down quarks, the last of those three, it wouldn't be true. Most of the mass would come out from the Higgs. The up and down happen to be very, very light, and so most of the mass of the proton and the neutron don't come from the quarks masses themselves. It comes from the masses of the force of the binding of, of those quarks together. And those are the gluons, did you call them? And that's, yeah, that's the gluons that are living inside of, inside of the proton and neutron. The gluons themselves have no mass, by the way. Each gluon has no mass, but it's the collective binding that contributes mass to the proton and neutron. Part three, we know what we want to find this Higgs, as well as dark matter and supersymmetry and black holes we built this huge machine and this massive detector for lots and lots of money, taking people tens of thousands of person years of, of time and effort, and, and what have we found? Well, let's start with those other things worth looking for, dark matter particles and things called supersymmetric particles. You heard about dark matter earlier from, from uh, Dr. Zakhariv and Schott. Black holes and extra dimensions, we've talked about those in the past, not for a while though, um, and anything unexpected. So remember, dark matter is supposed to be most of the mass of our galaxy. It's not ordinary protons and neutrons in known forms. It could be new particles that have masses of 10 or, or 100 times the mass of the proton, called WIMPs. And you heard about how people are looking for those deep underground. And supersymmetry, that's what SUSY stands for, supersymmetry is a theory, an extension to the standard model that was invented because many theoretical physicists believe the standard model has certain problems, either mathematical problems or aesthetic problems, and supersymmetry is part of most of the solutions and requires adding many, many new particles. So for every particle that I told you, add at least one, called it supersymmetric partner, and then add a few more. And the lightest of those could actually be good dark matter. So we have motivation for looking for new types of particles, dark matter particles, which might have to do with supersymmetry. And so far, when we crash things into them, we might hope to make one of those. Now, how would we see it? If it's dark matter, we've learned that dark matter goes, is going through this room right now. How would you see it if it, you made it an accelerator? And the way you'd see it is that there would be stuff missing. Right? You'd crash stuff in with a certain amount of energy and momentum, and what comes out doesn't have the same amount of energy and momentum. So that's called missing energy or missing momentum. And that's what you look for. And guess what? We haven't seen any. Okay, so people have looked for that. This would be an incredibly exciting discovery. We haven't seen any dark matter or supersymmetry or unexplained missing momentum or energy. Neutrinos can also give missing energy and momentum. We haven't seen it dark matter or supersymmetry this way or any other. What about black holes or extra dimensions? So normally we think of three dimensions of space. Things can have a length, a width, and a height. Right? You, can go forward, you can go right and left, or forward or backwards, or up and down. Or you can go north and south, or east and west, or up and down. Those are all ways of saying that there are three dimensions of space. Well, there are reasons why many physicists would like more than three dimensions of space. Turns out. If you had more, you would be able to explain why gravity is so very weak. And you could allow this thing called string theory to, to, to work. It wants six or seven more extra dimensions. And you'd have new places to go for, for physics conferences. Um, and a likely smoking gun of this is that you'd be able to make black, very small black holes that kind of stick into these extra dimensions. Um, tiny, tiny black holes. And, uh, that would be incredibly exciting. Here's what it kind of what it looked like. They'd make a black hole, and fortunately, the black hole would decay in a tiny fraction of a second. Okay. 
We know that because nature does this experiment far more often than the LHC does, and no black holes have swallowed the Earth recently. So here's the good news. Um, a black hole should disintegrate before it travels the width of an atom. And we should be able to see those black holes disintegrating and all the stuff coming out. The bad news is, the same as it was this fall, so far no black holes, no evidence for extra dimensions. And so if what you wanted to discover were unexpected things or kind of exotic extensions to the standard model, then the LHC and, uh, has not been a great success because haven't they haven't found anything like that. The good news is that we don't have to panic because the LHC was actually built to complete the standard model. The thing that was really driving it was finding this thing called the Higgs boson, this particle whose phi-associated field is supposed to be giving mass to fundamental particles. Now, making a Higgs is actually pretty easy. You collide, for example, two protons. They make Z particles, and those can collide to make a Higgs. So protons passing each other, they emit Z particles of Z particles, fuse, make a Higgs. But how do you know you made it? Because that Higgs particle is going to decay. In fact, there's many ways to make Higgs. There's why I showed you these Z fusion, gluon fusion, T fusion, bremsstrahling, all these things. Lots of ways to make Higgs. So what's so tough? Well, the first thing is the standard model didn't tell us enough about the Higgs. In particular, it doesn't tell us what the mass of the Higgs is. It's much easier to know, to look for something if you know where to look. The other thing is the fact that you can make the Higgs in so many ways means that there's all sorts of other things that can be happening around it. And the Higgs can decay to so many different things because it couples to everything. It's responsible for the masses of all the fundamental particles, which means it can actually decay into just about anything. So, as well, there are lots and lots and lots of other things being made decaying into the exact same stuff as the Higgs. So how do we go about finding a particle like this? And it starts again from this famous equation, E equals mc squared, which is actually only part of the story. This is the energy of a particle that's not moving, that's at rest. It has energy equal to its mass times the velocity of light squared. Okay. But what you really want to do is write this much prettier equation that the E squared is mc squared squared. Now that actually hasn't done anything. All I've done is square both sides of the equation. I actually have to move it over and subtract off something. I have to subtract off the energy due to the motion of things. So if I have something that's sitting at rest, it has a certain amount of energy, mc squared. If it's moving, it has more energy. But if I know how much energy it has and how, how it's moving, how much momentum it has, I can take the difference of those two things, after she have their squares, and find out how much mass it has. I can recover that original energy due just to its existence, to its mass. And so what we can do is, when a Higgs decays, we can add up the momentums and the energies of the things it decays into, and we can see if their sums follow this rule, if they actually came from something that had a particular mass. Okay? So stuff's coming out. We, t we look for pairs of particles or sets of particles that we can add up and check to see if they come from something that has a particular mass. Okay? So we can look, for example, for the Higgs decaying into two photons, two particles of light. So it's going along, and it decays, and they come out opposite each other. We can add up their energies and momentum and see what happens. So here is, here is a movie of what goes on when protons collide inside the CMS detector and make two photons. Here are the two photons. Here's the, the energies of the two photons deposited into the detector. Lots of these things represent lots of other par particles. You'll notice all these other tracks. Here is a picture of what, of what the event looked like. So you imagine you have tens of particles coming out, and you're trying to reconstruct these two photons that have zipped out from the decay of this Higgs. Somehow you have to reconstruct this event. Okay. So what you do is you check, as I said, the energies and momentums of these pairs of observed photons and look for a pattern. Okay. So look to see, do I have two? two prominent photons, prominent particles of light, 
that I can identify, you know, I have an event in which there are you know, clearly two photons, I take their energies and momentum, put them together and see did they, what do they add up to. And here's what people did. You have lots and lots of events. They could add up to 110 times the mass of the proton, 110 GV or 120 or 130. They can add up to anything. And what you do is you count how many times they add up to 110 or 120 or, or whatever. And you notice that you plot that. And you notice that there's this little bit of extra that happened to add up to very close to 125 GeV, about a, just over 125 times the mass of the proton. And you say, oh, wait, hold on a sec. Actually, all of these others that are here, I can explain them as due to other processes that I know that I can calculate, that I can expect, that I expected to see. So let me take away all these. And so here it is. And I say, OK, here's what I expected. I, I, you know, I, I measured about what I expected. But there were so, a lot of extra ones right around 125 GeV. And then you go and ask your friends in the other detector. What happened when you did this experiment? When you looked at photons coming out of your detector, pairs of photons, what did they add up to? And they say, well, we had all these ones that we expected, but then in addition we had a, a bunch of extra, and hey, they were at around 125 GeV. And you say, wow, that suggests that there was a particle there, a new particle, and it was decaying into pairs of photons. And you say, OK, well, is there anything else that such a particle could decay into? Well, it could decay into pairs of electrons and their antiparticles called positrons. So here's a pair, here, the, the red ones are an electron and a positron, and here's another electron and a positron in the other detector called Atlas. And you add them up, and guess what? Once again, they add up to 125 GeV in exactly the same way. And you're very excited, and so you announce the discovery of a new particle, okay, which you know is, has certain properties. It's a boson, just like the photon and the W and the Z, not like the electron. And so it's, bosons are a class of particle. You just, that's the discovery of a new uncharged boson. And you notice it doesn't say, you haven't, doesn't say you discovered the Higgs particle. So they announced the observation of a new particle in the search for the standard model Higgs boson. And CMS announced the observation of a new boson at a mass of 125 GeV. And they said that's consistent within uncertainties with the expectations of the standard model for Higgs boson, which is science speak for saying, you know, we all think this is the Higgs boson, but we can't tell you that because we have to go measure some more things about it to be, to be sure, to be confident that this is really the Higgs boson. So that was really the discover, the announcement of the discovery of what we are expecting is we're going to become ever more confident is in fact the Higgs boson. So what have people done since? That was in July of last year. Since then, they've lo also looked at other ways in which the Higgs can decay. Okay? And it turns out that those ones that I showed you about, the decay of the Higgs into two photons, represent about 0.2% of the time that the Higgs decays. One in every, you know, two in out of every thousand times the Higgs will decay to a pair of photons. And about 3% of the time, actually a fraction of 3% of the time, it'll decay into a pair of electrons. Most of the time it decays into other stuff. So they've looked at all the different ways that it can decay, and every time, every one of those ways it decays so far is consistent with uncertainties with the way this, theore this theory that we have called the standard model says that the Higgs should decay. So now we're more confident that this is really the Higgs boson of the standard model. Now they've also done other things. I told you that they said they found that it had no charge. That's something that the model tells us. It can't have any charge. It has to be neutral, like neutrons. It also can't have a property called spin. Unlike every other particle of the standard model, it has a property called spin. The Higgs boson can't have a property called spin. Guess what? As par far as they can tell, this particle has no spin. It is the first fundamental spinless particle. So I'd like to wind up by showing you a wonderful, I think, movie of how exactly, what, what exact, summarizing everything I've said made by the Atlas experiment. So we're going to watch, again, we're going to watch a Higgs being made right from the beginning of those protons uh, coming out of the Linux. So here we go. 
out of the LUNAC, into the booster, getting up to speed. So they go into the proton synchrotron. Now they're moving at, they have way more, the, very close to the speed of light. Now they have 450 times their mass energy and kinetic energy and energy of motion. Now they're in the LHC. This is the old LHC of about a year ago. So it's only 7,000 times. Down the LHC tunnel, these are, these are those magnets that, that accelerated in the LHC. You can see it's also curving very slowly due to superconducting magnets. Down the LHC tunnel, there's the proton. You can see the quarks rattling around inside it. Okay. Here comes the Atlas experiment. Down there, there's a proton coming from each side. Here's the detector. They smash in the center of the detector into each other. We get this huge spray of events. And here are pairs of particles coming, from, these long ones coming from the decay of the Higgs. This is actually an event in which two pairs of muons are made from the decay of the Higgs particle. So our $10 billion and our 20 years of work bought us this event. And for particle physicists, it's all worth it. Because there's a lot, much left to check but really, if this is not the standard model of Higgs boson, the last piece of this amazing theory that explains everything, pretty much everything it sets out to explain, then nature is playing a really cool trick on us. Thank you.